uh, yes, live stream in Zoom, but we are fixing our Facebook to start. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So we have few few moments more. Okay, we can start. <laughs> okay. Um, hi everyone. Welcome to the Key School of Economics Global Minds for Ukraine. Um, I know it's probably already a marathon. Um, and um, my name is Evgeny Manasirsky. I'm a friend of Kiev School of Economics, and uh, I'm a historian and graduate student in, in European and Russian studies at Yale University. And it's my special pleasure of, uh, as a historian and as a also, uh, I would say, Twitter inhabitant, uh, Twitter historian inhabitant, uh, to uh, welcome. Uh, uh, Kimberly St. Uh, Julian Varun uh, to our marathon initiative. She is a historian of the Soviet Union, Central Asia, Russia, and uh, East Germany, GDR. Um, she's currently a Penn Presidential PhD Fellow, and uh, she's a writer. She uh, also is myself, it's a, it's, a very, it's a big pleasure, not the person who jumped to the graduate school uh, uh, after, after undergrad, let's spend some time in the real world. She's right now a, a book reviewer editor for H Ukraine, a H -net, net, uh, H Net Network, uh, which is uh, basically promote on the, uh, promotes scholarly work and intellectual discussion on Ukraine and on other sciences, if you go to H Network, Net Network, there's like a bunch of everything. You, if you're interested in anything, I don't know any scholarly discipline, it's there. Especially for for social sciences, this is a treasure, as uh, almost as Twitter, but without without the limitations. <laughs> um, so, um, Kimberly, it's um, my special uh, special uh, pleasure to uh, to welcome you. And um, uh, we will talk in more or less a uh, podcast way, but I want to remind the audience that we have a Q&A uh, box uh, in Zoom and we have comment section in Facebook. Please write your, uh, your questions uh, along our conversation. Our, our questions are not endless. So, and, and your interesting questions are more interesting than my questions. Um, so, uh, Kimberly, first, I would like to ask you about uh, you being a historian, uh, you being a, a, your journey to the topic itself. So, because it's, it's uh, I would not say it's odd and nobody do this, but like, uh, it's, it's obviously a new wave in the history. Uh, in in Soviet studies for sure, and in European studies, in the in um, uh, global history, um, I would say in global history framework, which is now one one of the most fashionable thing to do. Um, so, how you came up with this composition of African and African Americans, like African American experiences in the Soviet Central Asia, in GDR, in Europe per se. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I wish I was in person. Um, I never got to go to campus when I was doing research in Kiev. So hopefully I'll be back soon. Um, but my research interests originally came from my experiences in Ukraine. Uh, when I was doing my master's research, I was working on the Holodomor and peasant experiences of the Holodomor and understandings of Soviet power. And so I was in Ukraine in 2013, I'm showing my age, in 2013, uh, working in Kiev in Odessa. And I was crossing the street. I was calling Krishnatik and I was kind of crossing the street. I saw this black person and we just looked at each other. And I was like, what are you doing here? She said, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, and that's how I learned about Afro-Ukrainians. And I, I couldn't believe I was like talking to an Afro-Ukrainian. So since then, um, my work has been trying to understand the experiences of Afro-Ukrainians and Afro-Russians, but also to tr better understand and examine experiences of Black people in the former Soviet Union, but also in the Soviet Union, um, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So if you don't know the history, in the 1920s and 30s, you can have this rise of the Soviet Union as this power that presented itself as anti-racist and particularly was enticing to many African-Americans who were leaving segregation racism in the United States, but also during the Great Depression. So 
the Soviet Union represented both racial equality and economic opportunity to many people. And so I was reading so much about these people, including Langston Hughes, uh, Paul Robeson, who went to the Soviet Union and who experienced often for the first time in their lives, racial equality. So you see these stories in the 20s and 30s of African-Americans. And then by the 60s and 70s, you have reports of African students walking around carrying knives to protect themselves and instances of, of racism against Africans. And by the 20 teens, particularly in Russia, um, it was very dangerous to be a person of color in Russia. You have you know, dozens of racial attacks and you know, there have been attacks in Ukraine as well. And so what I wanna understand is kind of this long arc of history. How do we go from the 1920s and 30s where you have this, both this time of rapid industrial change in the Soviet Union, you have famine, but you also have people going to the Soviet Union and experiencing types of freedoms that they don't have in their home countries to where we are in the 20 teens, where you have you know, an influx of, of racism against people of color, particularly not just Africans and African-Americans, but also Central Asians and people from the Caucasus and Russia. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get at um, with my research. It really was because I was doing research on another thing <laughs> and then something happened to me and that's where the idea came from. And how you fix it into like Central Asian experience because like uh, the um, the general thing, well, the propaganda, the Soviet propaganda of 1920s and 30s, this was the history of the um, those African-Americans who basically fleeing um, um, so they flee in the segregation, they see uh, fleeing John, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, John Crow America is yesterday, and they come to Central Asia. And this is mm -hmm. was actually the moment when, um, uh, segregated part of the American society meets recently segregated, uh, and not yet desegregated part of the Soviet society because Central Asia, which is was known like in, in Russian Empire as the Turkestan, uh, mm -hmm. now being in this flux of transformation in one republic, then another, and then ending up in four republics, basically. Uh, they visiting the, those cotton fields. Uh, uh -huh. And then and um, like how how you actually see this? How you see through this foster side of the uh, of the um, of the Hughes of the John McKay going to uh, uh, to the Con Congress of the Communist International, like uh, as few other people, and uh, the reality they they stumble upon because, like for instance, I'm coming from the Eastern Ukraine, but my mom mm -hmm. lives right now in Kharkiv. And she lives actually at the at the metro station, which is uh, Kharkiv Tractor Factory, which was built by the American uh, by the American engineers. And they're like they're actually building still. There. She's living in one of those buildings, which still called Americanka, which is like was built for American engineers. And um, no, so the thing, uh, the, my question is actually how you see through um, those uh, the, uh, those um, propaganda posters into the Central Asia context and how GDR appears because it's it's basically, um, it's actually for those who study uh, and like I, I will bring it to, uh, to the context so, so, uh, so people would not listen to the nerds. Uh, for those who study Soviet Union, they know that the Soviet Union is basically, it's, uh, there's no one entity, it's like it's few, few stages of transformation and post-war Soviet Union, especially enlargement into those people's republic uh, or, or republics of the people's democracies um, in, in the Central Europe after uh, Second World War. It was slightly another war, slightly another world, slightly another Soviet Union, and then after '53, it was drastically another Soviet Union. Uh, so, how you see through through those things, and how you compose them, how you compare them, because, for instance, if you're talking about African experience in GDR, it's actually a big topic right now here. And actually, I actually right now in Berlin. Uh, so it's actually a big topic here to talk about like this African, the Mozambique experience of, of people from Mozambique coming mm -hmm. here, study, live here, and, and then they become Germans and they coming back and they 
they they experience this double alienation they they nobody here and they nobody back at, at home so like how you how you bring those things together those are really good points um and so for the central asia part i was working i finished a piece that's coming out in an, in an edited volume um next year and i looked at african americans in soviet central asia in the pre in the the pre interwar era and i found it really interesting so what i was seeing it was particularly how african americans were seeing uzbeks soviet uzbeks and uh soviet tajiks they saw them as black and they described them as the blacks of the soviet union and so i was fascinated by like how this came to be and what was i what i saw were two major factors one is a lot of the southerner uh, the a lot of the african americans who went to soviet central asia were southerners they're from the southern united states and they were working in agriculture particularly cotton cotton production so that's what they were doing in soviet uzbekistan in particular they were working in the cotton fields and, and helping cultivate cotton in uzbekistan and so that material connection cotton was a key thing that connected um, it kind of built this kind of friendship between African Americans and the Uzbeks they encountered. But another part was skin color. A lot of African Americans are meeting people who were Uzbek or who were Tajik who looked like them, who had the same skin color as they did. And so you start seeing these interesting conversations, often through um, interpreters, but uh, the African Americans I was looking at who were writing about this and talking about their experiences, they see a shared history of oppression. They look at how the Uzbeks and Tajiks were treated under the Russian imperial government versus how they were treated under the Soviet government in the 20s and 30s, and they saw a lot of connections. So you have this kind of imagined shared history, but this actual material connection of cotton and skin color that kind of allowed African Americans to see and racialize Central Asians as Black. So that's kind of a, a, a project that's kind of enveloping into what I'm doing now. Um, and the post war period, it is very different. And so what I found is, Often in the literature, can, there's a conflation between African American and African experiences, and I think that this is a problem. And I think your question pointed out correctly with the example of the the Mozambican um, guest arbiter, so the the contract workers um, who went to the GDR um, during the Cold War. And so you have this problem of Africans are coming from newly independent countries, under countries that have legacies of colonialism. So the racial politics and racial understandings that a person from Mozambique or Ghana have versus an African-American from Alabama, Mississippi have, and the way that they see race in the Soviet Union and in the GDR are fundamentally different. And so what I hope to do in my work is to sh talk about those differences, but to also include the context of why these differences are important and the ways that race and racial understandings are very fluid and that it's fluid in terms of what's happening in Africa and in America, but also what's happening on the ground in the Soviet Union and in East Germany, if that makes sense. Uh, but they're, they're very complicated pieces that hopefully I will be able to put together in the next five years. Well, it's a big, pretty quick outline for, for five years. Um, so the can you clarify the, um, the stance, which is like, which is also problematic and uh, still discussed in the um, both in the Soviet and post-Soviet studies is the question about the perception and construction of race mm -hmm. and the perception of other race of other. So the racism and racisms uh, in, in the Soviet Union in post-Soviet countries because um, it's the general perception, the general the general rule of thumb, especially for those people who grew up in the Soviet Union, uh, like my parents, for instance, uh, the general perception would be this Druzhba Narodov, this this ideal idealized world where um, Soviet Union is a cradle of this uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the universal good perception of other. Like there's no uh, there is no differentiation for skin color. There is no, there is only ideological differentiation. <laughs> well, uh, uh, but uh, was it actually in fact true? Because uh, can you talk more about this um, idealized world of the Soviet uh, perception of race and, um, and race identity construction? How people- Sure. Uh, yeah, and, and this, how it shifted 
in uh, closer to the end of the Soviet Union, how the, how it's actually um, maybe perplexed that uh, uh, rise of racism, which we, we which we read in in the human rights reports uh, since the nineties. Mm -hmm. Um. So thinking about like the Druzhba Narodov, and it, it is very beautiful, and you see the propaganda posters and all the Soviet citizens of different countries are all holding hands and, you know, they're all in their national dress. But even in the, the interwar period, but particularly when you get to World War II, you start seeing how easily that crumbles, where you have the internal and mass uh, deportations of particular ethnic minorities, including Crimea Tatars, um, from their, their home nations to the interior of the Soviet Union. So even within the early Soviet period, you kind of start to see there is a hierarchy. And then after World War II, I mean, Russians have become like the first among equals, right? And so you still have that hierarchical structuring and, and privilege of, of particularly of, of the Russian people. So when you think about the so the 60s, 70s, and 80s, particularly in the 80s, you start seeing the outlines of kind of the situation we see now. Um, so Jeff Sahadeo has done really amazing work on the treatment of Central Asians in the late Soviet period. And he talks about how, and he does a lot of interviews, first-hand interviews, and you see how Central Asians were kept from the best universities and where they were forced to live and where they were allowed to live in places like Moscow and Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, because of the internal passport system. So the internal passport system that the Soviet Union produces, which is often as a result of the Holodomor because they did not want Ukrainian peasants going into the cities, um, that starts being a way to police and to prevent free movement. And that's often used against people like Central Asians, people like Georgians who don't have access to major metropolitan areas in the Soviet Union, you know, Leningrad, uh, Moscow, Kiev, Odessa, Kharkiv, to a lesser extent, but particularly in Russia, Ukraine is a bit more open in the Soviet period for, particularly for Central Asians and Caucasians, and you still see that now, where a large amount of Central Asians go to Ukraine because Ukraine is more welcoming and safer than Russia. So I would argue that you start seeing kind of these hierarchical structures in early in the in the Stalinist period. They become more clear during World War II, and they become more hardened. And then from the 70s and 80s, you start seeing the outlines of the out that I would say like institutional and structural racism and prejudice against um, various minority ethnicities in the Soviet Union. And those become who are being discriminated against now, particularly in Russia. And uh, recently, uh, recently you wrote like, uh, I think last year, the, the piece about the, uh, uh, the this curiosity of the Russian Lives Matter thing. I don't know how to, how to actually classify this. Uh, it's not even movement or it's like, it's, it's just occurrence of, of, uh, of, uh, of whatever propaganda uh, uh, trying to turn around the uh, Black, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and how it's been resembled in the Russian cultural pieces like the, the famous uh, movie Brat uh, mm -hmm. so like it's and um, it's actually like you, you, you I, it's it's interesting that you brought up the uh, Sahadeo's book because there's actually a very interesting uh, piece by Mikhail Zakharov uh, on the race and racism in Russia. Uh, well, like it's it's a whole book, but like it's it's mm -hmm. not really. so. Uh, I, I, I could you speak more about this? Um, this weird uh, combination of Russia's uh, um, racism and live and life through racism after uh, it being after the fall of the Soviet Union and what it turns it, it turned in because uh, um, again the uh, the whole conversation and the whole perception of Russia with the skinheads movements with the whole uh, nationalistic movements in the 90s, which also been recently um, put in a few very nice scholarly scholarly pieces. Uh, it's uh, it's some it's somewhat uh, it's somewhat faded faded out uh, by by Russian media and 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 
probably only people in the post soviet realm actually know about the the such a phenomenon as a mm-hmm. uh as a skinhead movement as a as a actual almost lynching of uh, central asians of uh, african uh, africans uh who come to study and like how how it's actually turned into um well very white movement this russian mm-hmm. uh, russian lives matter as all lives matter movement i excellent question and yeah i have I just moved into my new place a couple of days ago. So my books are in boxes, but I have Nicolai <laughs> Sagato's book, uh, um, amazing book. And so I think you're on a good point because I guess working on Eastern Europe for as long as I have, I was I tell people in America about like what I do and you know, skinheads, and they're like, what are skinheads? I'm like, how do you not know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think like I, what I take for granted working in, in the post Soviet region isn't for everybody apparently, but Russia has uh, it's been described as kind of a racial innocence. So you have this idea of, of the Druzhmanoroda, but also in the Soviet Union race technically didn't exist, and so Russia has been able to kind of you know capitalize on that idea that there is no race in the Soviet Union, so there's no race in Russia legally. In Russia, you don't identify as a race. So it's very hard to track racial attacks if you have people who cannot identify as a race. Um, but if you look at like the Sova Center, um, Human Rights Watch, they have been documenting, you know, all these attacks against Africans and these attacks against Central Asians. Um, a few years ago, there were, you know, stories of Moscow police officers throwing Central Asians off of roofs, right? And so this is a, this is and not this isn't just everyday racism. This is structural racism that we're seeing against people of color in Russia. And the Russian Lives Matter movement, and it popped up in response to the Black Lives Matter movement and the George Floyd protests in the United States. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, wow, Russian solidarity with Black Lives Matter. That was really surprising. And then I clicked on the Twitter handle and I started seeing the hashtags. And I was like, no, it's not solidarity. It's pretty much every racist meme you could think of. Uh, and it was really disturbing, um, really, t- to see how many people in the Russian Twitter sphere we're making fun of George Floyd for being murdered. We're making fun of Black people for being murdered at the hands of the police. But also the ways in which they were saying, well, we have issues with police in Russia, so why do we care about Black people in America? And what could have been a point of solidarity, being against state violence against citizens, became racialized and became you know, a point of nationalism. And you start seeing people talking about like, Central Asians and you know, people talking about how Central Asians are, are treated and mistreated by the police. And it became Russian Lives Matter for Russians, meaning ethnic Russians. And so what happens is that I would argue is that this isn't new, this strain of of Russian nationalism, but I think now people are in the West particularly are paying attention to the ways in which Russian nationalism goes and flows into white supremacy, but this doesn't remain in Russia. What I was interested in and what I kept seeing were how images and discourses of American white supremacy were influencing Russian discourses on race and whiteness. And this idea that some of these alt-right groups in America have of Russia as this Christian, holy, white place, which is a totally just incorrect understanding of Russia and who lives in Russia and what makes up Russia. And so Russia's in this really interesting place where some people believe racism can exist there because of the Soviet legacy. The people who do know racism exists there, it's very hard for them to talk about because they're in a dictatorship. And so there's not a lot of good publicly available information outside of academia, I would argue, that people can understand this. And so that's kind of what I'm also doing my public work is to shed light on these processes because nothing that happens in Russia stays in Russia. And I think we're all seeing that right now. Yeah, we all uh, we all actually see this, and it's it's, it's actually um, interesting to uh, actually to just for another point to point out this like those those movements, those uh, white supremacy almost movements, but not not an American type of white white supremacy. It's more of like Russian imperial white supremacy, black mm-hmm. hundred movement uh, of those skinheads, etc. Uh, or national Bolsheviks. This was like weird thing in 90s and early 2000s. Actually, the, the very interesting book came out just recently called It Will Be Fun and Terrifying, uh, 
about the uh, about this this type of movement, uh, and um, it's uh, it's it's also it's also per perplexing how um, this uh, those movements being excelled by the Russian uh, Russian government Russian authority into these patriotic movements. Because in the same time, they were suppressed after 2014, and in in order basically to create this strain of demobilization of society, mm -hmm. where uh, where not there is no legal civic civic activism whatsoever possible, besides from state issued whatever marches for May 9th parade, and that's it. Um, but uh, you talked about this solidarity, and uh, when I moved last year to New Haven, and what struck me after like years I haven't been there, uh, it's uh, houses in um, in almost suburb area of East Rock, where um, houses have Ukrainian flags. And Black Lives Matter posters on the on the bill from on on the same side or side by side on different mm -hmm. windows, uh, and uh, and it happened and, and it's it start it started happening of course after February twenty fourth after after invasion, and but you spotted this phenomenon uh, slightly earlier in the Kritika uh, in Ukrainian magazine Kritika you wrote. Uh, brilliant article uh, on um, uh, how Black Lives Matter movement, it's actually uh, close to a revolution of dignity to Euromaidan movement. And um, uh, it, it struck me when I read it first uh, uh, two years ago, or because at the moment I was writing my piece and it's called, I can't breathe. And then, and uh, it was about IDPs, uh, but, mm -hmm. and, the, and the civil rights, but uh, then um, it was more of the reference with a, a 2014 case. Uh, uh, but then the, the George Floyd's uh, happened and I said, and I said this, I, I have no right to use this anymore, but you use this so eloquently and to draw the line of uh, um, of closeness of those protests, can you uh, can you explain how uh, the uh, how especially Ukrainians should read this? The, because mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter movement it's it, it's underrepresented in Ukrainian media, and there's there's lack of specialists who can actually explain vividly what what's going on there and mm -hmm. why we should care. So thank you. And that piece was, so I, I'm in this really interesting position where I'm an African-American woman and I work on Ukraine. They're, I mean, considering the most African-Americans, there are not many of us, they're like less than a dozen who work on the post-Soviet region, the majority work on Russia. And so I'm in the position where I work on Russia and Ukraine. Um, and so I remember I was, I was a master's student when I saw the revolution of dignity happen. I'd just come back from Ukraine um, and it struck me like what Ukrainians were fighting for, but also how the Western media was talking about it and how they were interpreting it. And then after Maidan, you know, with the occupation of Luhansk and Donetsk, you know, the forced annexation, the legal seizure of Crimea. And I remember wondering, when are people gonna get tired? When, when is America, when is the media gonna get exhausted of this narrative? And then when Black Lives Matter was happening, when the George Floyd protests was happening and it was, once again, it was in the news and everyone cared about it. And I felt myself wondering and feeling the same thing. What's gonna happen, you know, once the media is exhausted? So I started thinking about institutionalization of change and what are people actually fighting for? What do people want? And what I saw was in, in Euro Maidan, but also in the Black Lives Matter protests, what you see is a public demand for visibility, but also for accountability and the striving towards a more free and open and responsive democracy and state. And that's what people want. And across the country, like in the United States and in Ukraine, that's what people are fighting for. And I kind of saw these early connections 
Um, and it was really interesting because now I'm, with the war, I feel like I'm like on base three now, like I'm, <laughs> it's another iteration. And if you gave me some leeway, cause I've been, I've been thinking about this. Cause now I find myself explaining why should African-Americans care about Ukraine? So it was, why should Ukrainians care about Black Lives Matter? Now I'm like, well, why should Americans care about Ukraine? And I think if we go con connect back to democracy and, and freedom, and I know these are very loose ideals, but it's about basic dignity, human dignity and human ability to formulate and participate in a government in a state that represents you and your interests, but also protects you. And I think when we look at what's happening in Ukraine, and I've been trying to using my online platform to try to explain these things, uh, because people are like, well, there are no Black people in Ukraine, why should I care? And I'm like, Afro-Ukrainians exist, so I've met them. <laughs> but also Ukraine has this really long history and this really intricate and fascinating history of, with African-Americans and Africans and also Afro-Ukrainians. So when you treat Ukraine as a solely white country or a Nazi country, you're buying into Russian lies, but also you are erasing centuries of Ukrainian history that show the diversity of this country, including people of color, including black people. So for me, what I try to explain is when you think about Black Lives Matter, when you think about the Ukrainian fight against Russia and how, what you are fighting against in both situations are dangerous hegemonic attitudes that other people and put people in hierarchies that also oppress people. Ukrainians are being oppressed because Russia has decided that Ukraine is not its own country and it does not respect the dignity and individuality of Ukrainians. Same thing with Black Lives Matter. When you see these people who are making fun of African-Americans who are killed by the police, they're you know denying the dignity and humanity of African-Americans. So if you put these two things together, the basic premise is a recognition of shared humanity, of shared dignity, and that both of these people and the, the fights that they are fighting individually are more representative of the struggles that are happening globally, I would argue. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for, uh, for this. And, I, I, and this is actually coming to my next question regarding, uh, oh, well, first I would actually, I just saw it in the chat, that's like our, uh, our host, said that's like the to to leave the questions in the comment section or please leave it wherever wherever is comfortable for you and i just we reached some some middle and i just need to remind it and need to remind this those people who are uh, watching us on the facebook live live stream please leave comments there we will receive them anyway um so my next question is actually also um regarding this why african uh, African Americans need may need to care about the um, war in Ukraine. Uh, in your piece, you wrote just a few weeks before the invasion. Uh, uh, this this stage of war started. Um, I called ice cream democ uh, democracy. You actually you coming out on the basically. American government and Biden administration for being uh, well patchy in uh, in their support, not not consistent enough, um, and um, uh, uh, particularly pointed out that the Progressive Caucus and how they uh, respond to the emergency in Ukraine, which wasn't that kind of emergency in January or or December. Um, and particularly, it comes to mind the Ilham Omar's uh, tweets recently about the sanctions against, uh, um, against Russia causing the food crisis, mm -hmm. which uh, caused a lot of, uh, well, um, eyebrows raised, I would say, uh, at least, and, and, and I would say this is in, in, the, most, uh, in the most decent way. Uh, not again, not to quote Twitter uh, uh, from people who actually looking out at those progressives as um, uh, as sources of light and good in uh, in the um, in the American government or uh, in in the Congress. The Congress, those people who represent 
um, truly European values uh, about healthcare and about care about mm-hmm. people. And here uh, you, you see person who uh, in power to talk to people, especially to young people, and and uh, uh, there's progressive actually saying that uh, well they bring up this interpretation of war which is not that uh, well not that clear not that detailed not that uh, not that nuanced um, mm-hmm. and and the outcry from from Ukrainians obviously that's that's obviously they didn't get it they didn't get the the logical sequence of events what causing what because one side one thing is to blame german government for be, not doing enough and this is like fairly okay the, the, uh, and another thing is uh have this beef with american representatives who are n- not well old white dudes from mm-hmm. from florida uh so um um yeah sorry i'm 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 using this this position to talk like this as as a student in america um so so how how actually this ice cream demo, diplomacy you described in january uh or when you was writing this paper maybe in december transferred into this kind of dip, diplomacy right now when the government the, the american government itself is taking a strong stance for ukraine though even parts of the Democratic Party is uh, misinterpreting the events and how it's actually, how those realities are are layering on uh, one another? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a, good, that's a good question. And I remember, so I, I got the idea for ice cream diplomacy because of the infamous like Ben and Jerry's tweet about the, the building Congress before the, the war uh, began and I was just really annoyed. <laughs> um, so I, I, I wrote this piece because I was trying to process and, and trying to put together why I was so angry about some these initial responses for you know from progressives that you know in terms of domestic policy politics I have I hold in high regard and I think it goes to a greater narrative and kind of showing of how weak many members of Congress are on foreign policy because it's very American centric and domestic policy centric. And so I think that that was one thing, but also I, and this goes back to watching 2014. um, And if you weren't paying attention to Ukraine, if you haven't been paying attention since 2014, and then you're suddenly paying attention in December and January, uh, December 2021, January, 2022, um, I think it can be easier to buy into like really Russian apologist narratives of what was going on um, because a lot of the tropes that we've seen, you know, the Zelensky is an agent of NATO. I'm like, they were, you know, lobbing that, um, you know, they've been lobbying that to the Ukrainian government since 2014. Um, but what the problem is, is I'll argue, it's, it's naivety in foreign policy and also and it goes back to this idea of the food crisis. And at this point, and I just saw another big progressive account talking about Ukraine being used by NATO and by the United States. Like, let's talk about this. One, those arguments are, are Russian apologetics. And they're wrapped in this language of we care about Ukraine. But really what they do is deny Ukraine agency. And to when you act and discuss Ukraine, as a puppet of the United States or NATO, you're denying Ukrainian agency, but also it's a perversion of what's happening in Ukraine right now. Ukrainians are not dying in droves protecting some NATO or American political idea. They are dying in droves because they're being murdered by Russians who are committing war crimes in a, a, in a way to rebuild this idea of the Russian empire. That's what's at stake here. So like just putting that firmly, like that's what's happening. Two, when we think about this idea of a food crisis, this food crisis is caused by the same country that has caused the war and all these unnecessary deaths, Russia. Vladimir Putin and the Russian government decided to invade Ukraine, and they did that. So the only blame is that is on the shoulders of Vladimir Putin. And when we think about war and food production, it's focusing on Russian food production, but ignoring the fact that Russians have been focusing on destroying the wheat fields of Ukraine. Ukraine is also a major 
grain producer and a grain exporter. And so what I have noticed and what this constantly makes me angry is you're many of these people are operating and interpreting the war under a Russian logic. And it is a logic of colonialism. It is a logic of neo-imperialism. It's a logic that denies Ukrainians agency. But also, honestly, when you discuss the war like that and you talk about um, food shortages and things like that, it ignores the fact that this is a global crisis, but Ukraine is fighting this war alone still. It's a global crisis and you know, so much hinges upon global, uh, uh, so many global things hinge upon Ukrainian victory, but Ukraine still fights alone. And that's what I've been, I'm, I'm thinking of a piece right now to kind of talk about as we go into the hundred days of war, what does it mean from when everyone was wearing blue and yellow, February 25th, everyone's supporting Ukraine and, you know, our lady of, you know, the drones versus now when people are, the media is getting exhausted in the West. People are starting to, you know, turn their attention to other things. And so I, I just have this fear. I feel the same I did in 2014. And with Crimea and with Luhansk and Donetsk. And that's my concern. So I'm trying to work through that. And I think the progressive, the earlier progressive view on Ukraine is becoming more dominant now than it was in, in, in February. And the... Uh... Again, to bring in to bring uh, on top of the uh, how people care, why people care, and uh, to more personal uh, domain uh, for you uh, from the beginning, um, from basically February twenty fourth, you turned in uh, from the PhD student into person who uh, first talk ever to everyone about Ukraine, uh, talk to media about Ukraine, trying to put the uh the things in perspective especially especially for those who are like who um well, would be surprised but also probably interested to to hear it from african american uh inside the in uh, inside the uh ukraine not just only from timothy snyder uh and i don't know maybe a few few other people who or ukrainians who, who are obviously biased here but also, uh, uh, um, he, from the very beginning, you was involved in the evacuation efforts uh, for the international students who was stuck uh, in besieged cities of Sumy of Kharkiv. Um, how does this happen to you? How's how's how the how the whole instrument uh, how the whole, whole methodological instruments came into your life to do this? Uh, because uh, it's it's it doesn't it doesn't seem obvious because I can come into media and writing which what was you already doing it's 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 a, lo a logical prolongation of what's what what you was already doing the con teleological continuation but uh, to actually go into activism on the on the level of managing transatlantic movements and transcontinental movements, I think there there was more than two continents involved. Uh, so uh, how how does this uh, happen to you, and how you get got yourself involved into this? Because as far as I I understand, you haven't been to Ukraine for for quite some years. Uh, you haven't had like active network here, uh, so like you had to establish this somehow um, uh, from the scratch? It's, it literally happened overnight. And I remember I was just tweeting because I've, you know, I've been on Twitter since like Twitter started. <laughs> like I started Twitter in like 2008. Um, and it was when, it was kind of the lead up. So December when things kind of started becoming more, um, I guess the West became, started becoming more interested. The media started talking about it more. So I just started doing kind of these threads. I'm like, well, I've been studying Ukrainian history since I was 18. I, I can use it now. You know, I could, it, you know, tell people about Ukraine. Um, and literally, I went to bed one night with like 9,000 followers. And I was like, okay, I am academic famous. I have 9,000 Twitter followers. And I woke up the next day and had 36,000. I'm like, I don't understand what's going on then in three days I had like 98,000 Twitter followers and so it, it happened very quickly um and then the videos started coming out there's one or two of the same video of African students 
trying to get out of, of Ukraine. Um, and so I started explaining just one, that there are Black people in Ukraine, that, you know, there are thousands of foreign students in Ukraine, including thousands of Africans. Um, and Sumi drew my attention because I had, I was tweeting to people and I was making, I made this list of a link tree of just different resources. And it was, I was trying to do everything I could. I'm like, cause I haven't been, I haven't been in Ukraine in years. And, um, you know, but I still love this country. And I just remember, like, I talk about him all the time, but Sergei Pokey, my professor at Harvard. And I remember watching him when everything was going on with Euromaidan and with Crimea, Luhansk and Donetsk. And I saw how he used his knowledge to help his country and to guide his country, but also to help Westerners understand why they should care. And I remember this watching him and being in awe of him but also feeling so powerless because I was, you know, a, a second year master's student. I'm like, what can I do? And so now I was like, well, I have a platform. I'm going to use it to the best of my ability and I'm going to tweet. So I tweeted, I started just looking out and kind of creating these lists of resources, people from like foreign students from Africa. These are resources you can use from India. These are resources you can use for Ukrainians who have, um, you know, medical issues or, you know, just kind of trying to address as many communities as I could as this migration crisis was beginning. And people, and I said, like, reach out to me if you need help. And if I can do something, you know, reach out to me. So people started messaging me on Twitter and I would tweet. I'm like, okay, I have a person who is stuck in, you know, Sumi who can't get out. Does anyone know anything? Um, and a Ukrainian woman from Sumi reached out to me on Twitter and we started talking. And like, I was talking to her every day and then she learned that she was living near some of the dorms where the foreign students were stuck. And a couple of the foreign students' friends who had already left or who were studying in Germany, they messaged me and said, hi, my friend so-and-so is in Sumi and can't get out. So that's how I got connected was on Twitter. And so we moved from Twitter to WhatsApp. And so I'm using WhatsApp and Twitter and Telegram to kind of coordinate between Ukrainians on the ground foreign students who were stuck, their families and friends who were in America and England and everywhere around the world. Um, and so what I was doing is just trying to put people together, mix and, mix and match people. But I think the biggest thing I did, particularly for the students assuming I have a contact with, was getting information to them because they spent so long in these bomb shelters because, um, I mean, Sumi was under siege. I mean, no person could get out, Ukrainian or otherwise, could get out of Sumi. But they were getting information from Russian sources saying Ukrainians are holding you hostage. And that was getting back to their family. So you have this huge uproar about something that isn't real, but they're freaking out. I mean, willfully so you're hearing bombing and you can't get out of this place. You don't know what's going on. So I was just trying to get as much clear information to them as possible and working to put pressure on people to open up a humanitarian corridor to force Russia to allow people to leave. And I remember Every other day, they would hear a rumor about a humanitarian corridor, and I'm telling them, don't leave. There's no way you can, your safety will be guaranteed. And so I used my network, but also just good people who, could, who reached out to me on the internet, and we worked together to keep these people safe. But also the woman I was in contact with in SUMI, she was able to get the phone number of the director of SUMI State who was working with the foreign students and he was able to get food to the foreign students. So it's really just a hope and a prayer and Twitter, which can also be a hellscape, but was also really beneficial um, for a lot of these foreign students. Um, and, but also just to reach out with Ukrainians as well. So I was trying to keep up with everyone. And whenever I had contacts on the ground, I had some friends who still in Ukraine, letting them know, hey, I have a family you know, who's gonna come just so you're aware in case they need you here, I gave them your contact information. So it was a lot of hodgepodge stuff, um, but I, I just think, I just wanna do the most amount of good as I can. Since I can't be in Ukraine right now, the least I can do you know, is the Twitter threads and trying to connect people and writing and just keeping pressure so Americans don't forget like they did in 2014. I don't want that to happen again. Uh, regarding this keeping people informed, I, I think the, the uh, problematic uh, question of those students being evacuated is, first of all, yes, make people understand that there are students coming to Ukraine and uh, just 
recently, the recent years, I've been figuring out that there are actually people from UK coming to study medicine. Mm -hmm. in UK. I, I actually have um, a friend at the sociology doctoral program at Yale whose whose brother is uh, was in Kharkiv med school. So um, and she's she's African American. And he's African American. So uh, it's it's it was getting more and more widespread. And to explain it to uh, to Americans, it's already a lot. But I think uh, of another dimension of this problem, which is explaining the. Uh, the claims and accusation of racism in crossing borders because there was there was a lot and for you as a historian who study race and identity to explain to what extent the the racism is actually the case uh, the racism is actually a problem uh, is it actually there uh, and uh, how the perception of other is actually working in in this uh, well, geographical and political realm how uh, how you how you was trying to put it in the larger perspective and explain people that's uh what you see or hear from the news it not was actually happening or it's actually happening not exactly like you see this it was um it was pretty difficult because it's all these people who magically literally found out on Twitter that there are black people in Ukraine. You know, like I've been working on this for you know, almost 10 years. And so I was trying to explain like, yes, there are instances of racism on the border. This is true. But also we have other instances where like Ukrainians are helping Africans. Like the students I was engaged with, I was talking to were being helped by Ukrainians. And then you have the situation of, it's a war, you, like the, the greater context, it's a war situation, you have a massive migration crisis where millions of people are trying to leave the country at the same time. And so what happens at the borders, you often get a confluence of kind of all these pressures at once, but also you have men trying to leave the country when men are not supposed to leave Ukraine from age like 18 to 60. Right? So you have so many different things going on at the same time, but like one or two videos become the source everyone uses. Or and this actually happened. I got attacked because one of the videos I said, like, do we know who made the video? Because one, you know, American media, you can't just use videos you find online. You have to be able to source them. So sourcing the video is important. But also my concern was, and I knew this would happen, whenever there is like a, a form of racism or a type of racism, Russia is really good at using that for its own advantage. And that happened in Sumi, where there's a group of African students that are out in the cold and they were, you know, just angry and they were scared you could see like in the videos and they're talking about they're keeping us as hostages you know they were just repeating things they had heard you know these are all unverified claims but these are people under stress who are distressed and the next day the russian foreign ministry tweeted out in english look at how ukraine treats foreign students all right so it took advantage of actual black distress for Russian advantage. And so I was trying to explain all of these things. I guess there's racism, but also there are instances where this isn't racism. This is also a way in which you have a migration crisis and the easiest way for many of these Ukrainian and Polish border officers to figure out who can go and who can't go within the first week of the war. If you're a Ukrainian, they presumed if you were a person of color, you weren't Ukrainian. Is that problematic in itself? Yes, but also, it, it, that was how they did it. And that was how they decided to and figured out who was Ukrainian and who wasn't. But another part of this was in the outset of the war, in that first couple of weeks, only like Ukrainians had the ability to go into Poland and Hungary because of the EU. So if you were a third country national person from, from India, from anywhere in the Middle East or from Africa, if your country did not have its own agreement with Poland or Hungary, you couldn't just cross the border. Right? So that isn't racism. These are issues of geopolitical importance that come to the fore at a point of time during war. So I've been trying to kind of explain all these different things that are going on because I'm also having speaking to people in you know, African students, Indian students who are being helped by Ukrainians who didn't experience racism at the border, but I also know you, you know, African students who did experience racism. You have diverse experiences as diverse as the people who are having them, but so often what becomes popular on social media becomes the narrative that we see in, you know, in national media. And um, to, uh, as I 
actually don't don't see the questions that are coming uh, coming to the end. Uh, I I wanted to wrap up this with the question I promised not to ask you, but I have to. Uh, I think I have to. Uh, it's actually how you, uh, uh, not about profiting or something, but more about how you actually thinking to put to, uh, to put together your uh, experience as the activist, as a person who actually been engaged with the problem of race and otherness in a post-Soviet realm, not through the books, though how great they are. Uh, but through uh, real instances of uh, um, um, of institutional and structural and uh, and emergency situation, it's it's absolutely a normal case. But again, it is a case. Uh, and as a scholar who uh, aspiring and actually working in the direction of race and identity in this particular region, in this particular particular uh, country, but 100 years ago. It's been interesting. Um, so like I'm working my dissertation perspectives and my dissertation is Russia, Ukraine, and Germany, and I can't go to Russia or Ukraine. And so I've been sitting here and I'm like, it's really weird to see your dissertation being lived out and you can't... <laughs> you know, do uh, the, your research, but I've been thinking about like I, this, what's happened in the war and what we've seen, but not just, you know, the instance at the border, but also how it's been interpreted on, on in the internet and responses to that. Um, like I, I'm, I'm trying to process and think through how I want to work with this because it's out of the scope of my dissertation because it's long after the Soviet Union collapses. Maybe this will be a second book, but I need to write about this because I, 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 there's a lot I want to explain. And there's a lot of nuance that needs to be included. And a Twitter thread's not enough. Like a, a 1,200 word article is not enough. This is a book project to be able to explain this. Not only what happened in Ukraine, but the internet's response to Ukraine and the ways in which race and othering has been often erased within Ukrainian history in terms of how Russia sees Ukraine and how important that is to understand the conflict. Um, but also there's this really disturbing trend I've seen where people don't believe that Russia was an empire because Russia wasn't engaged in the, the scramble for Africa. And I'm like, how do you think Russia got 11 time zones long? That was natural. But also if you don't know Russian imperial history, you fundamentally don't understand how Russia sees Ukraine, which is the cause of this war, right? So I, I think that in many ways, my activism comes from my knowledge as a historian, but also I've never just wanted my work to stay in a book. To me, my work is based on my own experiences, but also if, I, if I'm not helping people, you know, what's the point? And that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, uh, amen. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also thinking, I mean, this is actually the same how I see the, craft of the historian also being being involved. Um, the last thing I want to say, and this is just for, for the audience, please uh, go, go for kse.ua, go to uh, Kiev School of Economics Foundation. Kiev School of Economics uh, doing uh, tremendous and amazing work in raising money to uh, support Ukrainian armed forces, to support those in need. Uh, Kiev School of Economics Foundation already raised millions of dollars and supplied uh, army with uh, first aid kits, which is probably sometimes more important even than uh, helmet or uh, or bulletproof vest. Uh, but also they providing them and they providing food and all kinds of support for those who are in need. So all of uh, all of this marath marathon, all of this events in in Global Minds for Ukraine is uh, organized to support this race of um, uh, uh, fun, uh, of the funds for uh, Kiev School of Economics Foundation, and to light up the problems we're talking about in the world of the scholar of the work. Uh, I want to thank Kimberly uh, uh, for 
the uh, amazing hour uh, with us. Uh, I personally will try to stay in touch because I'm super interested and this is what I'm also doing as a, as a historian. Uh, but um, from the audience, from the whole key of school of economics, want to uh, thank uh, Kimberly, uh, Saint, uh, uh, Julian Baron for, uh, for being with us. I'm reminding the audience she's a uh, PhD student and, and, and presidential PhD fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, working on Ukraine, right, uh, race and uh, identity in uh, Soviet Union, Central Asia, East Germany, and Russia. Thank you, Kimberly, for, for being with us and uh, thank you for your support and your work. Thank you for having me.